Rain clouds hover over Ethiopia's central Rift Valley. The destinies of the farmers here are closely tied to the movement of these clouds. Christopher has been waiting for the rain, and now that it is finally here, he, along with hundreds of other farmers, is overjoyed. The fate of his crops will depend almost entirely on the amount of rain. When there is no rain, it is dry. People have no food. There is no grass, even for the cows. Only when there is rain, the grass grows. And only when there is rain, we get a good harvest. Life is impossible without rain. And it's not just Christopher whose destiny is dictated by the coming of the rain. Nearly 96% of all agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa is rainfall dependent. The realization that rain is often erratic has spurred many countries in this region to try and adopt modern irrigation techniques. It is easier said than done. I understand that there are improvements um, in the way uh, irrigation schemes are being developed and, well, planned, developed and uh, being implemented. Uh, however, there are still um, gaps that need to be filled up. The um, extension system is also training um, extension uh, workers for rainfed agriculture. If at all, they send these extension workers who are trained for rainfed also to uh, the irrigated schemes, assuming it is the same, but practically it is not the same. Food security in Africa depends on increasing productivity, which in turn depends on assured irrigation. We travel across Ethiopia and Malawi to understand how these two countries are facing up to the challenge of irrigation. First stop, Malawi. Millions continue to be food insecure here, but President Joyce Banda's government is determined to improve the situation. The goal? To end hunger and poverty. Irrigation is what will put away forever a food deficit in the country and also in, you know, poverty, poverty. Um, the government now is doing quite a few things. One of the things it's doing is um, irrigation is one of the big thrusts at the moment. At the moment, in my probably 50% of the time, I'm talking about irrigation in this ministry. I'm talking because that's where the future is. Which means that actually, if you can irrigate, it means on the same piece of land, you can grow crops two or three times. It's the same thing like you have expanded the, the land three times. In 2009, the Malawi government undertook an ambitious program, the Green Belt Initiative. It seeks to make the country independent of rain-fed agriculture. Under the initiative, the government hopes to irrigate a million hectares of land. So far, irrigation agriculture has already been introduced to one third of that land. We are targeting the whole spectrum of farmers, including the smallholders. Green Belt in Initiative is for the, for the smallholder, for the medium scale holder, as well as large scale private commercial um, owners. With three lakes and 13 perennial rivers cutting across the country, Malawi has access to sufficient water resources it can utilize for its irrigation needs. The Green Belt Initiative is doing exactly that. And one technique that is quickly gaining traction is treadle pumps. The good thing about the treadle pump is that we do not need to buy fuel to manage it. The pump is also easy to use. Only one person can manage it without any problem. It's also easy to carry it wherever you go. We find it easier to use than the water cans. Treadle pumps do not require any electricity to function. 
For that reason alone, the technology has become popular in areas without access to affordable electricity and capital. NGO Total Landcare has helped popularize the system in Mitundu. <laughs> Small farmers should use treadle pump because they do not have enough capital and have little access to credit. With the little money they have, it is impossible for them to use the engine pump. They will have to loan money and buy fuel for the engine pump. At the end, they will be forced to pay back the money. With the treadle pump, they do not have to borrow money. The one drawback, though, is that treadle pumps require a reliable source of water, and in areas where water is not available in significant quantities, the system has not had much success. Instead, farmers in such areas are turning to a more efficient system, drip irrigation. With drip irrigation, we will be getting more yields because we're using less amount of water compared to using a water can. And water is going directly to the plant. With the water cans, we used to just splash the water and that water would not directly go to the plant. There was a lot of waste of water here. With relatively low costs and a small amount of water required, drip irrigation is being touted as a viable solution for smallholders. If you compare the two, in terms of labor saving or in terms of water saving, this is the most economical between the two. Because in the treadle pump, there is a need for somebody to be constantly on the pump, on the treadles. Uh, and somebody should be there full time also directing the water in the field. Well, in this one, you just fill the buckets, off you go, then you just monitor how the drips are working. In many parts of sub Saharan Africa, access to even simple irrigation techniques like drip and treadle are a challenge for many farmers. Land holdings are so small sometimes that farmers can barely make the investment. In other places, even the little water required for basic irrigation does not exist. In these cases, farmers have to find alternative solutions. In areas where rainfall is all not enough, but irrigation is also not suitable, then we have to look for other livelihood means. Uh, could be moisture conservation and uh, the, uh, crops that are tolerant to uh, drought. One such solution is being practiced in this village in Malawi, where the introduction of drought-resistant, early maturing seeds has made all the difference. With relatively less rainfall and no access to irrigation, farmers here have been able to dramatically increase their yields. Where they could only grow one harvest a year, the early maturing seeds now allow them to harvest two, even three times each year. This time, we didn't have good rain. It rained very little. With the modern seeds that we get, maize and other crops mature early, so we take advantage of the little rain that we have. And in terms of quantity, we harvest high yields. The old seeds used to mature very late and required much more water. Other interesting solutions include crop diversification and conservation farming. Farmers are realizing that in the absence of reliable rainfall or sufficient irrigation, it is better to grow crops that require less water and also to use measures to conserve the moisture in the soil. In Tidi village, farmers are employing both these systems. When we cover the soil with the stalks, it keeps a lot of moisture in it and the ground becomes more fertile. So this way there will be some water in the soil even if it does not rain that much and you can harvest a lot of produce in a small land. But if farmers are producing more, they also need to sell more. Access to markets continues to be the single largest challenge to promoting irrigation practices in sub-Saharan Africa. So in Africa, one of the big problems in Africa, we don't have good roads. 
You don't have good access to other input. You don't have good access to the market. So when you don't have good access to the market for both output, and when you don't have good access, so you cannot buy input cheaply and you cannot sell your output very well, why invest in expensive irrigation systems that increase yield if you cannot really get all the other uh, input that really makes the yield effect very significant? In 1996, the government of Malawi set up a unique irrigation project for rice farmers in Chikwawa. By creating diversions of a river and building canals, farmers here were able to irrigate their fields. In time, the farmers were able to organize themselves into a successful water users association and take over the day-to-day -day operations of the project from the government. Crucially, the government also provided them basic training in marketing their produce. All farmers pay a basic fee to be part of the Water Users Association and this money is used as a fund for maintaining the project. The quality of life of the farmers here has greatly improved. The coming of the Water Users Association is welcome because it is helping us improve operations. We are now able to run our project without relying on the government. It has enabled local farmers to organize themselves and be able to repair any broken things. Whenever there's a problem, the members sit down and discuss the way forward together. To this end, recognizing the importance of basic training, the government in Malawi has also set up farmer business schools across the country. Here, farmers such as those of the Rice Cooperative of Chikwawa are trained in irrigation techniques, marketing fundamentals and agro-processing. These schools are run by Malawi's strong network of extension workers and their primary focus is to ensure an agro-economy comprising of well-trained, informed farmers. They have changed their attitudes towards farming as a business. Before, they didn't take farming as a business. This time, they are taking farming as a business. The second one is they have improved both yields plus profits. In the end, irrigation is going to be the major um, contributor to the economy of the country. And Malawi hopes its farmers will be the driving force behind that economy. The country's farmer business schools are seeing record turnouts, helping farmers become self-sufficient and secure their futures. My life has greatly changed thanks to the training. I can now send my children to school. I managed to buy some pigs and also some iron sheets for my house. I cannot see myself leaving the cooperative because I don't want to go back to my former life where I was suffering from deep poverty. From Malawi, we head over to Ethiopia, once synonymous with hunger and poverty. The country has since come a long way, drastically reducing its food gap, but its irrigation sector continues to linger in infancy, largely due to a lack of efficient extension services and capital. Irrigation projects are frequently launched and then they falter even faster. Despite its vast network of extension workers, farmers remain woefully ill-informed about modern irrigation techniques and are still completely dependent on the rain. irrigation uh, practices in Africa, irrigation projects in Ethiopia in particular, are not uh, very successful. If you go to the research result about 30% um, um, of the irrigation systems failed or they are uh, only suboptimally operating. If you take the case of Ethiopia, uh, about 95% of agricultural uh, activity is based on rainfall. Irrigation plays 4 to 5% uh, in terms of um, um, production. To increase its irrigation-led agriculture, the Ethiopian government launched a pilot irrigation project in Dodicha in the south in 2001. Its aim was to help farmers grow beans which could be exported to the international market. By 2012, 
The project site is dotted with broken pipes and disused pumps. The farmers are now once again waiting for the rain. We travel to Dodicha to find out where this project went wrong. I operate the motor pump. If it breaks, I report it to the chairman and afterwards the mechanics come and maintain it. But I cannot repair it myself. I need training to be able to do that. Me, I can only switch it on and switch it off. Many farmers in the area do not feel they have a stake in the project and extension workers have not been able to transfer the project's maintenance to the local community. The government has not been able to repair the irrigation infrastructure on site because of a lack of capital. Sadly, this project and many others such as this one continue to remain in a state of disrepair across Ethiopia. technologies which are used for irrigation. We have, we, have, we, have to, we have to buy from uh, abroad. There is a money problem, huh? hard currency problem. Uh, also the um, awareness of the farmers. The lack of capital to enhance crucial infrastructure is one of Ethiopia's biggest challenges in the irrigation sector. Private investors in irrigation are few and far between. In fact, Bru Tesfa and Michele is the only private company in the country that manufactures irrigation equipment. Their market is mostly large commercial farmers who have the means available to invest. There is a lack of uh, enough or adequate investment or capital. So that's why uh, many companies are just looking uh, for the, the potential of the agricultural uh, uh, technology uh, to start when it is uh, going to be realizable or practicable. But now most of the private farmers uh, and most of the uh, 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 small farmers are using traditional way of farming system. That's why people are not ready to uh, introduce technolo irrigation technology systems to the, to the country. Small farmers are only able to access Brute Tesfa's technology with financial support from either the government or donor agencies. Modern irrigation technology is still unaffordable for most farmers in Ethiopia, and even when they manage to access the equipment, they are left to their own means if and when it breaks down. There is a problem of operation and maintenance. There is a problem of insurance. You buy the pump, it collapses. You cannot maintain. There is no maintenance center where you bring it. There is no insurance to cover your uh, cost. So farmers are reluctant. Why should they buy a uh, pump and lose after uh, one harvest or even before a harvest? The Ethiopian government recognizes the need for a more developed irrigation sector. Its growth and transformation plan, launched in 2010, aims to increase the area under irrigation sixfold over the next five years. The lack of infrastructure and technology are proving to be the government's biggest obstacles. Its preferred solution is to attract foreign direct investment in the agriculture sector. Nearly 10% of all arable land in Ethiopia is now held by foreign investors. Large farms like Ethio Wedgfru, a joint venture between commercial farmers from Ethiopia and the Netherlands, are cropping up all over the country. It will also uh help us to transfer technology into, into, into the country and also uh, uh, to, 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 to create employment and uh, increase the country's export and increase and say foreign, foreign exchange. Uh, for FDA can therefore help us to uh, actually help our development in this country. And land has become Ethiopia's most valuable resource. In 2011 alone, the Ethiopian leased nearly 3.6 million hectares to foreign commercial investors producing high-value crops for the international market. It is hoped that these investors will develop sophisticated irrigation infrastructure in this land, but whether this policy will yield long-term benefits for Ethiopia remains to be seen. Many believe that these deals have one major flaw, the failure to treat water as an economic resource. Indirect investors coming like for example from, from Saudi people think they are coming for land but there is ample land in Saudi Arabia 
So they are not coming for land, but they are coming for water. Yes, we have to benefit from the water, but the water should be factored in, in the calculation. The move has also triggered fear amongst the local communities. Since all land in Ethiopia is owned by the government, it can be withdrawn from farmers any time if the government so chooses. There is big investment going on in this area. All the investors are here and they're taking away a lot of land. It was not like this before and now we don't know what will happen to our land. If the government takes our land, it will be a disaster for us. As the sun sets in the central Rift Valley, most farmers still go to bed wondering if the next day will bring any rain. For sub-Saharan agriculture to progress, nothing is more important than giving farmers the means to stop relying on the rain.